Hotswile Tanoya Tano and Siam in Siaya Kayachin Machup Kwanasot Ayawitz Winoxwitz. Greetings to all of you, my dear friends, my relatives. It is my honor to be with you today. My name is Latash. I am from the Squamish Nation, uh, living in North Vancouver on the unceded traditional Coast Salish territories. Uh, this area that we are in, um, Vancouver, for example, is on the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. We have been quite fortunate to have lived in this area for thousands of years and have learned many, many lessons from it. You know, one of the great lessons, great lessons is that, you know, we are a maritime people and we learn to travel by canoe. We learn to work together. We learn to support one another, to be at peace with each other, um, to have a good time with each other, to enjoy each other's company, uh, celebrate, each other's accomplishments. And these are some of the lessons that I would like to share with all of you today that are gathered for this very important seminar. We are gonna hear some good lessons today from our, our dear friend, Minnie Jean, who is uh, joining us today. So I wish you all a good day. Um, whenever we gather, um, my people, we gather, we. Um, Imagine that there's a hanger just outside the door to the place that we're gathering in, and we hang up our negativity on that little peg. You know, leave those negatives, whatever is happening in your life is not as important as what is going to take place within the next few moments. So be present, um, have an open mind, have a good heart, listen with your hearts, and take action. So have a good day, everyone, and welcome to this great event. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. We'll see you. Thank you, Elder Latash, and thank you for sharing your welcome and uh, your kind words and, and thoughts as we move forward into the conversation. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge the traditional territory to recognize its longer history, reaching beyond colonization and the establishment of European colonies, as well as its significance for the indigenous people who lived and continue to live upon this territory and who, whose practices and spiritualities are tied and continue to develop in relationship to the land and its inhabitants today. Um, at this point, I would like to extend my respect to the lands where all of you are also currently located and welcome you to place your own land acknowledgements in the chat box if you haven't already. So on to a few housekeeping items before we introduce um, uh, Minnie Jean. Uh, this is the fifth webinar in our intercultural series that runs once a month through May. You can find out more details um, about the past and upcoming webinars in the series on our website and we will put that in the chat shortly. And I would also like to remind everyone that our sessions are now one and a half hours long to um, allow for an extended presentation and Q&A time. Uh, we thank you for agreeing to our res respectful workplace policy and for f fostering a welcoming, growing, respectful, and safe environment for all. And I encourage you to do as Elder Latash suggested and um, come with come to this conversation with an open mind. While microphones have been muted, as always, there are multiple ways you can interact with us. We have our chat box um, where you can provide comments and interact with other attendees. Just remember to um, do, use the drop down and have all panelists and attendees clicked if you want everybody to see your comments. You can also ask for technical assistance through this and my colleague Tara Lynn will assist you. Thank you, TL. Um, and then there's the Q&A box. Please put any questions you have for Minnie Jean in this section. Feel free to type these in throughout the session um, and they can, so they can be integrated into the conversation, but also so that people can upvote your question and add comments. We will have a designated Q&A time at the end of the session as always. Now I'm going to introduce our moderator for our series, Todd Odgers, Associate Dean of International at BCIT, who will set the scene for this webinar and introduce our speaker for today. Todd, over to you. Thanks, CJ. And uh, thank you very much for your welcome, Alder Latash. 
and um, I'm looking forward to us working together more in the future. Uh, today, uh, I have the, the great honor to introduce Minnie Jean uh, Brown Tricky. And uh, Minnie Jean changed history by striding through the front doors of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. And as a member of the Little Rock Nine, and she's gonna give us some background on this. Uh, as a member of the Little Rock Nine, she helped us and helped, the, uh, helped to desegregate public schools and create a milestone in United States civil rights history. And this altered the course of education in America. Minnie Jean reminds us that racism is not over. She's received the US Congressional Gold, uh, Gold Medal, the Spring Arm Medal, the Wolf Award, and a medal from the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute, among other uh, citations. And under the Clinton administration, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary to the Department of the Interior for Diversity. And she's here today during Black History Month uh, to share perspective, some wisdom, and some lessons for us as international educators to learn from. And it's a great honor to play this role and a delight to speak with you today, Minnie Jean. And I wonder if you could um, activate your camera there, Minnie Jean, and your uh, and your mic, and maybe we can um, we'll uh, get uh, get started here. Hello. I can't find you. Welcome. It's good to see you. I'm, um, yeah, Minnie Jean, what we're going to do, we'll, uh, we'll go through a, a series of questions as we, as we had discussed earlier. And I was wondering if you could help us, because we are in the Canadian context a little bit more here, uh, for those of us that are not familiar or as familiar with the American Civil Rights Movement and school segregation and the system that you helped to dismantle, uh, can you give us a little bit of context? Oh, oh looks like we've lost her. Hey, EJ, I think uh, just give us a moment. She'll be back. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay, would you like me to rephrase the uh, question? Uh, please. Okay, uh, for those of us that are not as familiar with the American Civil Rights Movement, school segregation, and that system that you addressed and helped, helped to dismantle, can you give us a short history for Canadians and others that are less familiar with that? Uh, and outline, like, why did that happen? What was happening? And why did you play the role you played uh, at that stage in history? Okay, great question. Um, I was born 1941 into the Arkansas, which is the South, uh, with all this black codes and Jim Crow laws. Keep my start I'm on. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what that means. I think it means uh, it was meant to indicate that blacks were inferior, whites were superior. So all, everything was segregated. Schools, we couldn't go to hotels, movie theaters, train cars, buses, everything was segregated and there was, it was called colored then. Um, water fountains, restrooms, everything. But, um, in the black community, we were sheltered from all those and we had all everything, YWCA, my mom was a Girl Scout leader. So we had this kind of parallel life that was comfortable and safe. Uh, so a couple of things happened in when I was a teenager. One was the brown, versus Board of Education uh, Supreme Court decision that said segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. So I think I was 13, I didn't think too much of it. I thought, 
okay, so we'll all go to school together. I had friends who lived across the street from white schools, but they couldn't go there. So I just thought, oh, all this silliness is going to be over. But so there these, was, if I can ask, so in the Canadian context, so they lived across the street from these schools, but they were not admitted into those schools. They couldn't go to the, because they were white schools. So they had to be, they would have to walk a long way to another school or be yes. something? Yeah. yeah. Um, so even when you're a kid, you see some of this and you think, okay. So after the Brown decision, there were lots of rallies and opposition to desegregation, but I, I saw old people. So I thought, this is, this is a problem with old people. This is a disease of old people. Right. Yeah, Certainly yeah. not about teenagers or kids. Um, and the other thing that happened uh, when I was 14 was the lynching death of a boy called Emmett Till in Mississippi and Arkansas is right next to Mississippi. This boy was tortured and, and killed, uh, apparently because he looked at a, he was 14, he looked at a white woman wrong in a store. Uh, so this was a real shock and it was the first kind of feeling, you know what, this is kind of scary. Uh, I don't know if I am safe. So when, uh, it was announced on the intercom in my high school when I was in, in the spring of 1957 saying, if you live in the central district and you wanna go, sign this sheet. And of, I, of course, because it was all people, certainly not would be interesting to go to the most beautiful high school in America, which had a stadium, track, it was built at great expense and was called the most beautiful high school in America. And it was 10 blocks from my house. So there was a bit of naivete, I totally admit that, and frivolity when I signed up to go to Central. So that was that part. Uh, fast forward to, got new dress, new shoes, <laughs> really excited about going to Monday school. <laughs> but I bet you didn't have those cool red glasses then. I did not. I didn't wear glasses <laughs> then. <laughs> so uh, I, I, my best friend, half block away, we were going. So we were pretty excited and did all the things that young people do when they're going to a new school. And on the night before the opening of school, the governor of the state says, I'm putting units of the National Guard around the school mm. and pretty much said to protect citizens. So he said, if integration happens in Little Rock, blood will run in the streets. So I'm starting to think, hmm, what? Um, so he said he wants to protect citizens. He kind of, you know, was kind of vague. So, so he put units all around the school, Arkansas National Guard. And on the morning that we went to go to school, the Arkansas National Guard closed ranks and didn't allow us to come in. So, so you were barred entry to the school? Yes, by orders of the governor. And so, as the eight of us, I think, we were sandwiched between a mob of people screaming hatred and kill them and all kinds of horrible things that people can say. And the Arkansas National Guard. So we ended up sort of slinking away because we weren't gonna get in. So of course there were all kinds of injunctions and legal fights and uh, we had to go to federal district court and the judge ruled that uh, desegregation should continue. And President Eisenhower had to negotiate with Governor Favis to remove the National Guard. I wish I could speed this up, but um, 
And he did remove the National Guard, but it was three weeks later when we went again to enter Central and we were to be protected by the city police. The mob had grown quite larger and certainly more vociferous and hateful. And so I, I, we had to go home again because we got into the school and through a side door and we were there about an hour and we were told to go into the basement and we were put in these two police cars and told to keep our heads down and the drivers who were Little Rock police to get out of there as fast as they could and not to stop for anything because the mob heard we were in the school and they were gonna storm the school. And they also attacked brutally um, black reporters and other white reporters because the whole world was there to see this. Uh, so the mob went totally mad, attacking and brutalizing people. So I just so, want to under, I want to underline here, Minnie Jean, this is because nine black students in Arkansas wanted to go to high school. Absolutely, <laughs> it, it truly is. I mean, you know, Sometimes I think about it and I cry and other times I think about it and I just laugh, right? <laughs> because it's that. Um, so because the world was watching and Eisenhower scholars, um, some say that he sent 1,200 soldiers of the 101st Airborne, the roughest, toughest army unit to protect us. Some say he sent it because he saw the violence and others say he sent them because the world was watching. These images went around the world. And I know that because we got letters from around the world. So we were escorted into the school. The mob was dispersed by the 101st. So uh, let me just say that a lot of terror took place inside the school. So I was really disappointed in my teenage girls and boys because I found out they had that disease too. Yeah. Um, it was very, you know. There was one interview I watched where, you, where and I'm gonna quote you in one of these interviews, you said, um, when I went to school that day, I thought the white kids are going to be like me, curious, thoughtful, and want to cut out this segregation stuff. I did. Uh, but I, what I've come to understand over time, while my family was trying to make me uh, open-minded and thoughtful and confident, they were being told that they were superior and that I couldn't couldn't learn and that was and I didn't know that until much later. Mm -hmm. So I would say the reason that part I want to make a connection because I know that we'll be asked about Black Lives Matter, but the lynching of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm had the same effect that the death of say Trayvon Martin had uh, in terms of it yeah. woke people up, it, it woke me up. It, so I wanted to go to that school because I thought, you know, I can fix some of this. I think um, if they're like me, it's really important for young people to get together. Then I can actually, I really thought, I can prevent things like this from happening because, well, but that's because we don't know and we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And that's I, one I of the bless, it's one of the blessings of youth, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I we think it's great. Them. But I'll tell you a couple of things that uh, are, are about me. When I saw the mob and their behavior, I told myself, so I, so 
an amazing transformation. You think you can't transform at 15, I can tell you. And I said, yeah. I'll never be like that. Yeah. And I will never. And I'll work on behalf of everybody because this can't be. I mean, I, I must. This, so I'll never be violent. So it was really easy for me to sort of accept the principles of nonviolence and, and see that the first one is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Yeah. So I think maybe the greatest amount of courage that I have and had is to be nonviolent because that's a hard thing in a deeply violent society and world. You know, um, but, the non, yeah. non, your nonviolence is something I actually really want to talk about a little bit later, and um, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. And after, I think we're getting a little bit of a context here, and I'm going to ask you a question. I hope um, uh, I, I watched an interview of yours, and you talked about um, uh, when you decided to not study any longer at Central High and you moved to New York City and your mom took you uh, took you and escorted you to, to so that you could study at a new school called, uh, was it called New Lincoln? Yes. New Lincoln School. And it was apparently a, quite a revolutionary school at its time. And I'm going to quote you again because I, I thought this was the most beautiful thing I've, I've heard in a long time. Um, and I, I think about this, I'm going to quote this because I think about, we are international educators, the audience of this, and inclusion is a big deal. Uh, we, we have an extremely diverse student population, and I thought, this is not to minimize the experience you had in a really difficult I get it. Don't context, worry. but you said, going to that school, changing to New, New Lincoln allowed me to be the girl I wanted to be. And I'm wondering what was it about New Lincoln that made that possible? Uh, New Lincoln was a private or private progressive school. In New York City, it was predominantly Jewish. Um, the students were pretty wealthy and um, it was in a, 10 story building uh, right across from the, one of the lakes in Central Park. And so I could be in the plays and we wrote musicals and I had friends and they laughed at my French with a Southern accent. And I cried about their grandmothers who had tattoos from the Holocaust. Wow. So it just, to this girl from Arkansas, just to have, to expand my world. And, you know, in, in Arkansas, there are two groups of people, black and white. There were not even Latinos there. And there certainly weren't very many people from other countries. So when I get to New York, I see so people in saris and, it's like, oh my goodness, this is the world that I want. This is the world I believe in. And so part of, it was just, so my children say that part of the reason that I'm not bitter about Little Rock is because I got healed in that year and a half mm -hmm. at uh, New Lincoln. That, wow. that may be so. In some ways you met the students that you hoped that you were going to meet yes. at Central High. And I thought everybody's like me. And that was, and they were. And that was good. So it was beautiful. You know, I think the folks that are in this seminar, you know, we're, um, we're international educators and we receive students from abroad and we send students abroad and they go into these completely new cultural contexts. Uh, and they create a new identity in a way of be understanding themselves. Is that comparable? Well, absolutely. And the other thing is the family I lived with, we had um, American Field Service Committee, uh, teenage, uh, high school student from Finland. So I got it all, I got everything. Uh, just this shift in 
my consciousness and mm. uh, that expansion of thought that I had always desired anyway. Mm. And I, th mm. so, um, yeah, perfect. And yeah. one of the things is um, feeling miseducated completely, which was true. Um, not knowing about the world because part of the American uh, social conditioning is this is the best place and all the anthems and the pledges and I'm living in a segregated world but I'm still being sort of trying to persuade it that this is the best place in the world and the enemies are outside because yeah. the Soviets want to get us and we're hiding under the desk so these these kinds of ways of Con socially conditioning young people really upset me, right? So this school kind of broke things open, and and I'm wondering, you know, uh, earlier you let you you sort of fed forward that you know that we're going to talk about the Black Lives Matter, of course, absolutely uh, movement, and I think you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was a little bit of a stalker, you know, I was reading about you, I've been reading about you a lot um, in preparation of this, Minnie Jean, and you say the most beautiful thing in this one interview about, you describe Sophie, is it Sophie or Sophia in the Golden Girls? And, uh, oh, right. and you say, uh, yeah, Sophia says in the Golden Girls, and you know, my grandma, my grandmother loved that show, and um, but the, the truth about being wise, this is what she says, the truth about <laughs> being wise is that you've seen everything two times. Yes, that totally is it. <laughs> I can't believe how <laughs> really, I could get to like your philosophy path. from Sophia. It was so perfect. <laughs> and so how does that relate, you know, to your lived experience with, you know, Black Lives Matter? But I mean, let's face it, you were at the very, very front edge of the civil rights movement, I mean, that Dr. King and others were dying for. And and uh, so how is that? Okay, so Little Rock was the first uh, sort of civil rights thing that was completely filmed. Uh, media, uh, people came from around the world because it was a constitutional conflict. And I think everybody wanted to say, na 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 US, pretty much like they're probably doing now. Uh, so there again, twice more, more than that. But what I would say, if we, if we wanna talk, when I talked about Emmett Till, yeah. and I talked about Little Rock, like Little Rock was televised and every veteran civil rights person that I've met and many, you know, cause we're all elderly men, said that Little Rock was what turned them on to their activism. Because you see these kids, like we are 14 and 15. Uh, we turned 16 sort of in the fall. Yeah. Uh, and so the, when, sometimes when I look at those kids, I'm inspired because the mob is screaming. They threw away their dignity and it landed on us, right? We're, Puzzled for sure, saddened, disturbed, but we're standing there and they're just going wild. And so, so we talk, so we talk about the death of Emmett Till, Little Rock. And I think people just said enough of this. You know, there's something that just, I don't know how to explain it. I was thinking about it last night, something that you just wake up one morning and you say, this is I'm enough of this. Yeah. And so- And, and the, BL, the Black Lives Matter- Exactly the same thing. So when Trevon- Yeah, it was, it was enough, enough. And so my personal definition of movement is what a movement is, is people doing things simultaneously in different places for their own reasons. And I, I fully believe that because we see that. 
And we saw that in the early civil rights movement. We see that in Black Lives Matter. Mm. And the, the collective protests, people all over the world feeling some kind of collective kinship because there were things in their lives that they were feeling enough mm -hmm. of this, right? So mm -hmm. I found it um, so inspiring and it felt so much like the, the 60s and, and, and it pulls in all of us for all kinds of reasons. We really don't have to know why people were marching. We, we yeah. don't need to know, we just, they yeah. felt this collective necessity to march. So that to me is the magical part of that movement. And so mm -hmm. I'm totally inspired and moved by it and with admiration. And so, but mm -hmm. when I'm talking to young people and I do quite a lot of that, I, I have to say, there's so many ways of being activists and you don't have to go and get your head kicked in or, no. but you can be, you know, poetry is in right now, everybody, <laughs> um, you know, it's suddenly, and, and so that, that's the magical moment for all the poets. And, you know, we in the sort of sixties uh, grew up with, um, music that was, you know, Bob Dylan and, and the rock, everybody was singing about social change. Yeah. So we had, we had a music to go with our thought. So that was a very important thing. So, okay, so I say kids, you can be an artist, you can be a poet, you can be a musician, you can do really well in school, right? And so, <laughs> I love to hear your voice like this right now because I did um, in CNN you were interviewed and about Black Lives Matter. I think it was around some of the darker times of Black Lives Matter and a lot of the pushback. And um, and you said that you were feeling sad because you were wondering whether all the work and the effort and the sacrifice that you and others that had been through what you went through, whether it had mattered. I'll tell you, I had no sense that I could ever be a depressed person. But I spent some time really uh, in a great deal of sadness. And so my, my own children were worried and they kept saying, what can we do? And I said, vanilla ice cream and chocolate, okay? <laughs> Fly me with those things and see. And I did come out of it and yeah. um, I was really, I don't like this word, but as a social worker, triggered by the insurrection on the sixth, because I had, I knew these people, I met these people when I was 15 yeah. years old. And I kind of, what a, you know, uh, Desmond Cole says there are no borders when it comes to racism. He's a young uh, Canadian black writer who writes about anti-black racism. What's his name again? Desmond Cole, and his book is called "The Skin We're In." Okay. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, I don't know where I was going. Oh, you were talking about um, the events of the sixth, and uh, oh yeah, because I. You had met those people before. Yeah, and I, and so I I was uh, coming up in the sort of in the middle of the night. How did I describe them? And I I consider people like that. They are locked in hate, and that that it's a lockedness that cannot be, cannot see, cannot feel, cannot think, and. I want, when I'm talking to young people, I want them to be the opposite of that. I want them to be open and mm. thoughtful 
and finding out about themselves. And so that's really why I like having conversations with, with young people so much. Um, so let me just make the Little Rock story so that it can yeah. be. So for me, it has, um, it's a morality play because it, it has uh, an array of choices that people made or can make in their lives. So I start with the power, which is mm -hmm. the governor who had the power to prevent us. Uh, the mob, you could be part of the mob. Uh, you could be part of the 200 to 300 mean kids. You could be part of the 20 nice kids who, who treated us smiled at least or you could be one of little rock nine but you mostly and what people usually are is part of the silent witnesses the people who stand by it and say nothing and so i used to quote ellie wiesel as a holocaust survivor who talked about sometimes it's not those who do the deed it's those who are indifferent, di indifferent, but I've got another one that I like even better, and his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was actually a victim of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and he was a theologian, and I quote, he says, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. And he said, God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Mm -hmm. Not to act is to act. I love that. I just love it because it just mm -hmm. fits. It's, if we're silent witnesses, we're acting. We're acting. Not to speak oh. is to act. And so, you know, has the wisdom cycles come around, Minnie Jean, and you're seeing this for at least a second time? I, I would imagine you probably have seen this before, but this big circle, I'm wondering what the Black Lives Matter movement, it's changed from where the space was, even though we saw these folk on the six, which was something. Um, what can, what can it teach educators like us about how we can, how we need to, or what we can do to make uh, our institutions and our work more anti-racist and more inclusive? Well, I mean, right, okay, so I, I, I watched uh, the, uh, your webinars and I heard these really great processes and I'm saying that we almost have to start way earlier. We can't wait till people get into college, right? And there has to be uh, really anti-racism, which is to me, unlearning mm -hmm. racism. Uh, so I talk to kids in first grade and third grade and they love it. Um, so if I were, and I do, and I think I told you I have, I'd say 15,000 letters from young people and they're way smarter than we give them. We, whew, the stuff they talk to me about and what they mm. say to me. And I told you about uh, getting a uh, hundred questions from Denmark. Right. So our young people can tell us exactly what we need. Mm. I know we think we're the experts but they're the experts of their lives. They are, and they can tell us. I, I taught uh, in the Bay Area um, with a person who was, uh, I call what Freire calls the banking kind of teaching and I'm the, the discussion kind of teacher. And we had so much, I mean, we had people in that class who had so much, information that if we just let them talk for a bit, you know, we didn't have to give them the whole class, but they, they had so much information about what 
their lives were like and what they were dealing with. And young Latino boys uh, were saying they were being stopped by cops all the time. And the person I was teaching with hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, so they can, they help us and they can help us. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I worked a lot with immigrant women, uh, indigenous. I've had, in, in, in 79 years, I've done a lot of everything. And you are based. You are based in Canada now, right? You must be. There must be an interesting similarities that you're seeing, but also some differences that you're seeing well, in the context. Okay, so I came to Canada in 1967. So it was a really fun year because Trudeau, you know, <laughs> the first one. Woohoo! Yeah, I mean, it was a whole different sort of um, leader. It was very exciting. And um, and kind of was right at that time, sort of anti-war uh, focus. Uh, but it's funny, we lived in a flat in Toronto, and the uh, the other flat people were Ojibwe from Perry Island. So oh. we went there every weekend. Every weekend, we drove out of Toronto. And, and went to Perry Island to that um, community. And so I got that welcome to the land from those people mm. early when I first got here. So that was a, a space of knowledge that I hadn't known. And wow, so it's funny. Uh, go there every weekend. And it was uh, an overclass, overcast day and we're fishing on Georgian Bay. And my husband got a really bad sunburn because, which was funny to me because I didn't get one. But, but I mean, just the, the idea that it was overcast so you don't think that you can get a sunburn and you can. So now with my own grandchildren, I'll say, don't worry. It's just because it's overcast doesn't mean you're safe. Right. Um, so having that uh, sort of experience with indigenous peoples, and then a lot of in Northern Ontario, uh, there was a particular band, Bear Island band in the, to Miskimi area that was having um, old growth forest issues, which is fairly common in Canada. And I was very much involved in that uh, protest and actually arrested twice for that and actually worked with, uh, I can't call it teaching, but um, discussing nonviolence as as the way we were gonna do it. And even the band, um, when, it, when it first started, I think they were just protesting, which, which happens. But then when they started incorporating nonviolence, they actually created a level of respect by the Ontario Provincial Police. So it's very mm -hmm. powerful stuff, right? There's there's a couple of quotes that you've said over the years about nonviolence. It's I'm so thankful you've come to this place in this conversation because one quote you said, um, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. And that's and then, the third principle. That wow, it's not is it rocket science? Um, it says. It's way more powerful than rocket science. Um, not really. Like, I mean, how how horrible is that? How ideological is that? Winning friendship and just so I mean, it's the simplicity of it uh, kind of belies the complexity of it, right? Um, it's really kids love it 
And we have all these ways of teaching them how to be violent. And we don't have many ways of teaching them not to be violent. And so. Are there teachers or resources that you really like that have helped you with when you're engaging and teaching, teaching children yeah. or teaching others? Yeah, the ones who asked me to come and just say, go crazy, right? I want my kids to have this experience. I want them to be with you. Um, there's a group of teenagers in Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown, Ohio is the most, it's the worst city in America. It's been designated that because it's poverty, no jobs, every plant has closed. So there's a group of black kids and a couple of white kids went on this, um, I'm involved in a thing called Sojourn to the Past, and that's how um, we take in 10,000 kids on 10-day interactive history experiences to the South. And so I'm with young people all the time. Hmm. So um, you take them as a group, so students, the young yeah. people will go to the South with you, okay. Yeah, we have buses and we were meeting with all the veterans most they're dying like in the in the 20 years that I've been doing it 10 of the veterans have died because we're elderly that's it yeah. um but these kids from Youngstown Ohio the most horrible city after they went on the trip they went back home they started teaching nonviolence in their study halls. Wow. Uh, they got the mayor to declare nonviolence week, the first week in October. They went to the governor and he designated October as nonviolence month. They are still mentoring other kids of all the kids who go on our trips and there's the range, ethnicity, class, culture, we had them everything. If we kind of believed what we tend to believe, those kids were the ones people would have not expected to do that. So I, you know, I had a thing here about uh, Chimamandi. Adichie, and she says, we have to be careful about the single story. Right. Because that can mess us up and it can also uh, hurt, uh, hurt people. Mm -hmm. So have I been to schools in Canada? Yes. Um, even in this area, in the greater um, Vancouver area. Are, are are there some fundamentals? Are there some uh, fundamentals that we have international educators here? Some of our some of the people participating have children, but also they teach in the secondary uh, school system, uh, maybe primary as well. Uh, but and also, of course, some of us work in higher education. If you think about your experience, you know, we started talking about the context that you came from and the example that you lived, uh, you are, and and the tool uh, from hearing from you, the primary, one of the core tools is nonviolence. Well, what can folks, what can folk maybe take away uh, as international educators from regarding fundamentals of nonviolence in this? Well, they're just simple and they can, they can actually uh, change people's minds. Okay, uh, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. So we, that's, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not, not people. people. Yeah. So that's where our focus is not making enemies or seeing enemies in people, but the working to an injustice. And that mm -hmm. includes everyone, right? It just, it's an, uh, we're talking about inclusion. 
that's the whole understanding of it, inclusion. That's everybody. Um, Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. And nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. Okay, that one's a hard one for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I've seen it. I mean, it kind of feels religious, maybe it is spiritual. And it seems really simple. And I think I talked to you about uh, asking people to frame uh, the principles of nonviolence in their hallways. And, and then call and let me know what happened. And then I get these, like people are bowing and scraping. Oh my God, I can't believe what happened in our school. Wow. Because let me tell you why I think. Because we don't know what rules to live by. I mean, we're all different kinds of religions and all that. What are, what are, Biblical thing, that's too hard, right? Mm -hmm. That's too stringent. You know, I, I, I maybe want to do some of that. So we offer, I think it offers a soft approach to how we can be toward each other. Doesn't make demands, doesn't say you better, doesn't say you'll be punished if you don't. It's a softer general. Just a little nudge. You can seek to defeat injustice, not people. Our institutions, <laughs> our institutions are very secular as well. So that kind of just uh, diffuses all of that, you know. It just it's just so anyway, that's how I feel about it. I was listening to uh, Angela Davis until the wee hours of last night and so there was a period where um, people were talking about black power and that wasn't understood either. It wasn't about black hatred of anybody, right? It was about I too am valuable, I too. I mean, when, when we talk of black lives matter, to me, it means at its base, secretly, that we all matter. Of course it does. Of course that's what it means. But we have to focus so that you can see the relationship between your life and mm -hmm. that life. So that's how I, I see that movement is just kind of, um, pulls people in because their own lives matter. So I mean, that's, mm. that to me is the magic of looking at injustice, not people. Mm. There's, you know, there's a, there's a question in the Q and A here and I see that. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> that I was wondering, you know, the folks out there asked, there's a couple of really great ones. Uh, Somebody, so earlier you mentioned the single story and I wonder if we could start with that one. Could you talk a little bit more about how you, you, know, you, you raised the, the danger of a single story and how that relates to your experience and why, why that's a powerful... Um, well, that, that thing about the kids from Youngstown, Ohio who are black and poor and certainly weren't in, among all the kids that we interacted with would be the last ones that we would expect to do what they did. So we have these, these kind of beliefs about each other. The other part of that is uh, I read in Ottawa, a couple of organizations. Uh, one was uh, immigrant women's organization with an interpretation language interpretation um, component, pardon me. <coughs> and one of the things that was so interesting was so many of those women were way more educated than I mm -hmm. was. 
and but couldn't get jobs and so ended up you know as domestics and uh, just and when trying to so <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about with the interpretation service and the immigrant women the people we needed to train were the white service providers which is which is kind of not because I, I I saw some of the plans for uh, being intercultural. They're not the problem. It's not those people who are the problem. It's the, it's the, the, re, the people who are in charge of things who are the problem. As, as sad as that is. Right? They're the ones who need to be trained. Right. You know. Hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Are there are there any people that you um, in the in the era of the, another Chelsea asked the question? Um, is there anyone in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement recently? and thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, who inspires you or who, who do you think is doing, are there some folk, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of names here. Are there, I think folks here, you know, um, I'm seeing in the chat, people are really thankful for some links that you're saying things and like EJ and others are, finding those links and putting them in the chat right now. Are there any others that you find that, that we as educators would maybe find inspirational or useful or practical? I, I don't know who the, uh, I don't know the Black Lives Matter people mm -hmm. personally. I know people around them. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I can't even, I can't even drop their names. But it's a it's kind of like you need to be I was friends with John Lewis. He did John Lewis was this uh, civil rights person who was very nobody knew we don't know anything about these people until they die. So he died in the spring and um, so we saw pictures of his um, work and what he had done, but he was a congressperson. So he started off as a young person, as a, a serious activist, re relatively ra radical activist. Then he um, is in Congress, but everybody who talked about him after he died said they felt they were his best friend. He was a person who made everybody feel like he was their best friend. And so I was talking to my daughter about it and she said, well, you have that quality. What is your problem? And I said, <laughs> no, one, one does not know if they have that quality. It's not a, it's not a known quantity. It is, um, yeah, so that kind of activism to to be able to talk to people and persuade them to do things that they might not want to do because they feel a relationship with you, right? So these we're talking about activisms. We're, we're, we're not just, we have to be thoughtful about the many possibilities for our means of social change. Mm. So who do I? Mm. Well, let me tell you, Buffy St. Marie and I were made elders at the same time at Carleton University. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. We by some, it was very beautiful. For and it was because we worked for indigenous peoples around the world. So I've had some cool things. Hey. Wow. Sophia, baby, girl, you know what you <laughs> Wow, oh, yeah. Buffy. Yeah, you know, in this webinar, people are, um, 
yeah, I'm going to cycle back to what you said earlier about New Lincoln and folks here are international educators and we're trying to create inclusive campuses and ed educational experiences and I'm thinking you know if you speak from your heart and your the wisdom of your experience what kind of advice would you have that we as educators can help bring out the girl that always wanted that they always somebody some of our students always wanted to become because our students are taking a leap of faith their families are taking a leap of faith in the inclusiveness of our own education systems and many of our students are racialized or come from different kinds of diversities yeah what can we do well first of all that single story is a real mistake um chimamanda adichie is a actually an a novelist and she's nigerian and i'll tell you she says nigerians are the most arrogant people on earth okay <laughs> but we have to be able to receive that when we're in uh, interacting with people when i was trying to train people about somalis i was saying uh, they come from a dominant society they act just like white people that's why you can't stand them and so we have these differences of people's personal experience that come into our lives. And we have to step back and wait and let them help us understand them. Uh, so that to, I want to underline that we have to step back and wait to help them. them and let them us. tell us who, who they are. So I had to. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, when people were coming from the Soviet Union and sort of coming at a, you know, I said, well, you know, you spent your whole life hating these people. Now they're coming. You gotta, you gotta be open to them. You can't keep that because Canada was the same as US. They were the enemies, blah, blah. They're coming. They have they do not find you to be the best thing in the world. You know, they're very strident people. Be ready and be open. Mm -hmm. I mean, just this whole range of how people can be and what our sort of limited sort of understanding. I mean, we, <laughs> we're the ones who are almost, we're, yeah, we're the ones who need to learn actually. Um, and the other thing I think that if I were, I think um, diversity, uh, equity, I think all that's very important. But this stuff is, is about changing policy. That's where we, that's where we, that's where our efforts, because as much as we, you know, we win friends and influence people. If the policies are draconian, then we're, we're not going anywhere, right? And so when I first came to Canada, I had the indigenous experience, but I also folded into the, the anti-war mo movement and also the kind of civil rights movement. So I was like this person who could kind of fit into those places and nobody knew anything about me because I was Gene Tricky and that was perfect. Now uh, because you were you were known as Gene Tricky. Yeah. So let me tell you what is being screamed at us in this modern age. You don't have to guess. It's not obscure. We're being told every day that racism is a problem. Now we saw the amazing uh, Dr. Terpel Lafon report on racism against indigenous people in health. You can you could almost fill in the blanks on that, right? Yeah. What, everybody's telling us what the pro telling us what the problem is. Black Lives Matter. They're telling us what the problem is. Reports telling us the indigenous people wanting uh, 
indigenization of pedagogy uh, in schools. The Reconciliation. School, yeah, everybody is telling us what the problem is and what is needed. And that's, that's the part, open the mind and the ears because there is no question what we're being told right now. No question. It's maybe I just can hear it screaming in my ear, but I think it's loud enough for everybody to hear. Yeah, it's 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 definitely there. It's it's all around us. I think that you know. I want to thank. I think you know BCCIE has given me this privilege of having these really from. Uh, for me personally, life-changing conversations uh, with people and perspective, life-changing, potentially transformative, you know, as I'm a bit of a soaker. You know, I, it takes time for me to sort of put those, I like the game Tetris, you know, the blocks kind of falling into places. But, you know, this has been really uh, an amazing conversation. And there's one more question in the question and answer box. And we have a couple minutes left for that. And if anyone else had another question uh, for Minnie Jean, now would be the time to ask. Hurry, <laughs> hurry. Step right up. And, um, you know, there's another question here that says, you know, what role do Canadian youth have today in leading change uh, in addressing and uh, eliminating racism? The same way I said, they can be artists, musicians. Um, uh, I work with a group uh, in Surrey mm -hmm. of kids. They're opening up a gallery, a black art gallery. Um, I've sat with them. They have a meeting place. They're, they're the, there are different ethnic groups, which I think is kind of cool. Um, they're, they have um, the Middle Eastern just a range of kids from different sort of heritages and they're doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. They're doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. And they're doing, so one group does um, computer, I don't know, they, I don't know what they do, but they, <laughs> but they work, but they're getting jobs with people because they're really good at what they do. And uh, this one group, they're doing the art gallery. Um, they meet and part of, I think, the, the reason for some of this was to sort of counter what could kiss could be in gangs or whatever. So, hey, it's, they can tell us that too. If you don't give them anything to do, if you don't encourage their creativity, of course, because everybody is looking for some kind of collective yeah. uh, relationship, working with other people, right, in different ways. Which, you know, that sort of relates to a question that's an, a new question in the box, and it's, I think it's so close to what you're talking about. One of the individuals asked about third space. Um, Bo here asks a question about how reconciliation, anti-racism, uh, how we can address it in terms of thinking about creating third spaces. Are you, are you familiar with, I, with I that? Think, I don't, I'm not sure. Can you explain it? Yeah, it, you know, and even I, you know, um, I've worked with people that, that um, talk about the creation of a third space and how, um, you know, it's not your space, it's not my space, but we create a more, another space that's a shared space that we co-create. Yeah, that's my, that was my understanding. Okay. Okay, I don't know, but I mean, I know that uh, people of color say uh, they need a safe space because, and white people say they need a safe space. And it just cracks me up, right? I mean, for goodness sakes, have the damn discussion and enjoy it. And so what if you, get insulted, you know, come back again, right? I mean, part of some cultures is hurling insults from back and forth. You know, maybe we could appropriate something like that to 
be able to manage these complex conversations. Mm. We're way intelligent enough to do this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see Bo has put something in the uh, chat. So there is people that are participating. I'm. It's a link, and I'm presuming that it's about third spaces. So maybe folks can take away well, that Yeah, idea. I'll figure it out. I'll learn, right? <laughs> see, here we go. <laughs> Learning is everywhere. It's a life Yeah, we're all, we're all in a process of emerging yeah. into something. Yeah, so cool. You know, um, there's one other question here, uh, and I think this might be our last one. Um, Sonia asked, uh, I wonder if Ms. Brown Tricky's observations about how racism is handled uh, on the whole in Canada. Okay, so this is a comparative question. So you know, what's been your experience um, between uh, the Canadian context and uh, the US context in terms of addressing issues of racism and discrimination? Well, I think the, 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 the practice, I mean, okay, I'm gonna make people upset. Sometimes I get mad at Canada because it, it doesn't have a sense of self-determination and it does almost the same things as they do in the US, mm -hmm. such as the different exclusion, Asian exclusion acts and, and incarceration of Japanese, you know, I mean, yeah. like, come on, people. And so the rules and the laws were very similar in Canada. And it took a lot of work to undo the, the racism that was part of the Canadian thought, belief, and behavior. So uh, people have worked very hard. I spent, um, I have a book that that I, it's called The Color of Democracy, Racism in Canadian Society. And it was written, I think, a, a new edition came out in 2009. It's so amazing. Hmm. Um, it's by a group um, of scholars and community people. Uh, so we don't get off scot-free which means it's gonna be exciting doing the work, okay? Gee whiz, if you really don't wanna be the US, then don't do what the US does. Yeah. And yeah. so the, the, so I think I, I said, Malala and I had the same experience, uh, but we want, we prefer, in sort of this North American thing. We prefer to look at Malala than to look here in our home and where we live in this space at this girl who had the same experience. And she would have been shot if, she, if they hadn't thrown her out because they hated her that much, okay? And it was about education and it was about school. And we always look outside and say there they have this and oh look how but it's a we need our mirror just look and we'll find it and then we will be, have the excitement of changing it and that satisfaction of creating it yeah yeah of having had that Having done the heavy lifting, right? Uh, of having been a part of the change that we want to create and we want to see in the world. Quote somebody I think that was is kind of famous. And uh, to paraphrase. And you know, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let um I have to I'm gonna let EJ come in. Oh, Minajin, go Wait, for it. I have one more thing. Yeah, Since please do, please do. I, I use this poem, it's by Spanish um, Machado poet. Uh, Wayfair. Oh, Antonio Machado. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've probably heard this one. Mm. Wayfair, there is no road. Mm. Your footsteps are the road and nothing else. We make the road by walking. By walking, we make the road. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. I thank you so much for quoting Machado. Oh my goodness. And thank you so much for your time today. Uh, this has been really 
uh, I can see through the chat and I can you know, tell by the way I, you're making me feel. Uh, I think this was an important conversation. My honor, please. Thank you very much. I yeah. was so. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to let EJ come in here and okay. sort of do. Yeah, thanks, EJ. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to extend my gratitude as well to Minnie Jean for joining us and, and for Todd for also moderating and being the interviewer. I feel like, Minnie Jean, honestly, your, your story is so powerful and the incredible amount of optimism you have through telling these stories just um, during such a challenging time, it's enough to inspire us and keep us going. Um, and thank you for sharing the resources and the names and thank you everybody else out there for um, keeping that chat really busy um, and, and sharing your thoughts and asking your questions. This really was a really powerful webinar. So thanks again. Um, and just before everybody leaves, I want to remind Mind you, our next webinar, the sixth webinar, is on March 30th, and it is called the intersection of. Um, it will be exploring the intersection of race and intercultural on our campuses. Minnie Jean, we welcome you to join us for that one as well I to do. view it. Um, and it's going to be a really in incredible conversation as well. So, to everyone out there, have a safe and healthy day, afternoon, and we will see you next month. And I want to say one thing about that next upcoming one, Minnie Jean. They're two powerful upcoming women. Yep. Cool. I'm on it. I, I'm subscribed to your thing. Fabulous. I'm hooked. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Minnie Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. It's my Bye. honor. I'm going to be